Hi guys. Well, I really appreciate you sticking with me through the thick and thin of Peruvian plunge where we are beginning our second plunge into the Peruvian Amazon where we find ourselves at Manu Learning Center instead of Manu Wildlife Center here on July 5th 2009 in chapter 22 seeds of doubt seeds of doubt take it away <clears throat> a clammy gray dawn rolled over my new learning center like a wet walrus i groped my way out of my mosquito net actually a cucaracha net as i had discovered to my disgust several times during the night and into my damp clothes, which had been colonized by at least six more cockroaches seeking shelter from the chill. The thick clouds hung over the jungle like a soggy canvas tarp, which is how they would remain for my nine-day stay in the driest month of the year. Not an auspicious beginning to my next chapter. The single cold gelatinous fried egg that served as my breakfast did little to warm my spirits, but at least the coffee was passable and hot, so buoyed by the caffeine, I set off on a quiet Sunday morning to explore my new environs in search of a tranquil place to catch up on my writing. The Kriya's website had promised me a, quote, library, described as a, quote, quiet place for study with an archive of useful information. Unfortunately, I was never able to sniff out this library, which remained as elusive as El Dorado, the mythical Inca city of gold. It was, un it was abundantly clear already that my tranquil place would not be inside the tiny lounge in the dining room either, so I headed outside to widen the scope of my search. Joaquin had been up front with me that his 1,500 acres of land had already been logged, so I only had myself to blame for my Kapok tree Tarzan fantasies that I would be able to find any primary forest there. Since there were clearly no big trees between the lodge and the river, I had much better trees in my yard in Texas than I could see anywhere. I set off into the backwoods. Perhaps 500 yards down the soggy, muddy trail, I was barefooted and ankle deep in the cold mud. I had yet to find a single tree as big as <clears throat> those in my yard in Texas. <clears throat> This search for big trees in the Amazon jungle would become a regular frustration of mine as time passed. <clears throat> a movement in one of the spindly second growth trees caught my eye. It was a dusky titi monkey, my first and so far only sighting. He was about 20 feet up the tree, shoulders hunched against a cold drizzle, alone like me on a depressing Sunday morning. He gazed down at me desultorily with the eyes of the solitary traveler, as if to say, Hey buddy, can you front me the gas money to get my monkey ass to a real jungle? <clears throat> Locking eyes with his intelligent, sad face, I could hear the lugubrious voice of Chris Christopherson singing his depressing ode to days just like this one, Sunday morning, coming down. <clears throat> Before I started wishing, Lord, that I was stoned, I headed back toward the Mother of God. That walk would be the longest walk I would take for more than a week. My rough little map showed three gardens between the lodge and the river. The orchid garden, the, med the medicinal, medicinal plant garden, and the organic vegetable bio garden that was so prominently featured on the CREA's website. <clears throat> 
The first of these was a pleasant little sanctuary tucked away in a leafy corner of the forest beside a rushing mountain stream that tumbled over a 30-foot waterfall on its way to the river. The 50 or so orchids, most of them native to the chilly cloud forest much higher up the slopes of the eastern Andes than where we were, had been planted in little hollowed-out logs suspended from a framework of wooden poles. This framework was topped by a shade cloth to keep the to keep the tender, sunshy cloud forest residents shielded from the hot sun of the lowland rainforest. Clearly not a threat that day. Unfortunately, none of the plants were blooming, though I didn't know whether that had more to do with the time of year or, as I suspected, with the fact that the delicate, temperamental plants were way out of their element. While the orchid garden made a nice meditation spot, I failed to see how it was going to help preserve the genetic diversity of the high cloud forest, which I think is the hazy goal of the project, for the simple reason that Mandu Learning Center is not in the high cloud forest where orchids flourish. My doom and gloomy doubts about genetic preservation of Peruvian flora were only exacerbated by my two-minute visit to the sad little medicinal plant garden. Had it not been for the little tags identifying the dozen or so varieties of spindly, bug-munched medicinal plants, all of which look like they were in desperate need of medical attention themselves, I would have had no choice, I would have had no clue I was in a medicinal plant garden. I never did figure out what the exact purpose of the shabby little patch was supposed to be, other than to serve as one more little pebble in the tree hugger's David's slingshot against the Goliath of the plant eaters. Considering that is the purpose of this book, who am I to question the motives of my fellow tree huggers' methods? What the orchid garden and medicinal plant garden lacked in scope and vision was more than compensated for by the grand vision of Manu Learning Center's pride and joy, the organic vegetable bio garden that was supposed to serve as the model for Salvacion's poverty-stricken populace to emulate in their own yards at home. The first thing I noticed upon arriving at the half-acre fence compound with its manicured raised beds, its rainproof area of expensive greenhouse roofing, have you ever priced that shit at Home Depot? Ouch! and its well-built, sturdy compost shed that it would take two lifetimes of your average Salvacion peasant's vegetable buying budget <clears throat> to reproduce such a prototype. The second thing I noticed about the garden that it was that its loose, rich, loamy soil inside the painstakingly constructed raised beds was so micromanaged by the eco-tiers that it looked more like it had been vacuumed than weeded. The third thing I noticed about the expensive manicured bio-garden was, except for two dozen or so spindly little tomato plants hiding out from the rain under the pricey greenhouse roofing, that there was zero evidence that this garden was going to produce one morsel of food in the foreseeable future. There was not enough food here to feed a grasshopper, much less a third world village of awakening souls. <clears throat> the hungry looking little tomato plants, six of which may have added up to one decent sized plant in my own organic garden back in Texas, were being protected by the expensive roof to keep them from being pulverized by the torrential rains. Of course, this meant, ironically enough, in the middle of a rainforest, that the plants had to be watered. 
There was no drip irrigation system in this bio garden. In charge of this duty on this soggy Sunday morning was one of the Crea's eco tears, a sweet young woman from England who was tending to her charges with a little plastic watering can. Being a lifelong organic gardener myself, I approached her to educate myself about the finer points of bio-gardening in the Peruvian Amazon. I began by asking her how the idea was being received by the villagers in Salvacion. I believe we were up to nine gardens at one point, but one woman's brother-in-law built a house on top of one of them, she reported. Then the village of Salvacion built a pavement, those were her exact words, on top of another one, so I believe we now stand at seven. She invited me to attend the next construction project scheduled the following Monday, and I gladly accepted. Recognizing at least three ways I could have tripled the tomato crop I was looking at, I politely suggested they might want to put a little chicken shit in the soil. We thought of that, but it's hard to collect chicken poo in Salvacion where all the chickens just run around loose all over town. Good point, I said. Well, there's always fish. You know, the old Powhatan method the pilgrims used, burying a little fish at the bottom of each plant. I used to do that with my garden in Florida and got great results. I know there's got to be plenty of fish in Salvacion. Me grandma uses fish poo on her garden, and she has the greenest grass in town, beamed the proud granddaughter. Fish poo? Now there's a collection method I want to see. Forget the loose chickens. I do remember us putting something on the seeds in the last garden we built, she added, searching her organic gardening databank. What was that stuff? Oh yeah, ash. At least I think it was ash, but I don't think it was fertilizer. It was supposed to keep something from eating the seeds. Birds, maybe? My Spanish isn't that good. I miss a lot of what they teach us here. I know how you feel, I commiserated. <sighs> well, my uh, computer has now decided it's going to go flying off. Uh, good Lord, I am sorry. I know how you feel, I commiserated. I've been coming to Latin America since before you were born, and I still catch only every fourth word. This news <clears throat> was not accepted well by the frustrated young Spanish student. Listen, she said, looking as if she would burst into tears at any moment. I really don't know the first thing about gardening. I'm not a very good person to talk to about it. I left a nice young woman with the low, with the low self-esteem to her task and set off through the drizzle to the Riverview Gazebo, which I figured would become my tranquil office to catch up on Peruvian Plunge. I was just the tiniest bit irritated to find another volunteer, this one a young medical student, at least that's what he claimed, from San Diego, California, taking a couple of months break from his studies, sprawled out in the very hammock I was aiming for, reading one of those two million page historical dramas. He was bundled up from head to toe, only his face and hands emerging from protective layers of cloth. Even the cuffs of his pants were stuffed inside his knee-high socks. A bottle of deet stood guard against winged six-legged invaders that could hunt him down in the almost ant-proof hammock. <clears throat> You'd better be careful with those bare feet, the future doctor, who we'll call Hippocrates, warned me. The chiggers are hell down here. They'll eat your ass alive. Well, 
I'll be turning 50 in a couple of months, I said. I grew up in the Deep South. I live in Texas, and I've been coming to Latin America for 20 years. Never once since the day I was born have I been bitten by a chigger. The lucky man, he said, genuinely jealous. I've never seen so many fucking bugs in my life is in this place. Well, amigo, you are in the Peruvian Amazon after all. This isn't the best place I can think of for folks who can't deal with a few bugs. After this introduction, I was astonished to learn that the arachnophobic young man had signed on to be a volunteer in an organic garden, an insect magnet that can attract bugs to the 75th floor of the Sears Tower in Chicago in January. I told him about the conversation I had just finished with a naive young woman from England. He admitted, not at all sheepishly, that he too knew virtually nothing about gardening, organic, or otherwise. <clears throat> These people down here, you know, meaning the people living in Salvacion, these people down here are even more clueless than I am, though, he was quick to point out. They've never even heard of compost. Hell, even I have heard of compost. The way he viewed it, the locals' ignorance of something so basic as composting was indicative of a much wider social problem in rural Peru. It was this gringo maddening, all-pervasive, mindless inefficiency that he saw everywhere around him that was keeping Peru and the rest of Latin America locked in this self-defeating cycle of never being able to catch up with the gringos and the Europeans, assuming that was their goal. <clears throat> and the problem is bad enough right here at Manu Learning Center. <clears throat> There's an unbelievable amount of energy and talent being wasted here that could be getting put to good use. I've got nothing to do here for the next week. Some sort of insect, real or imagined, threatened to penetrate Hippocrates' deep-soaked cocoon he had spun for himself in the hammock, and the growly, eco-tier organic gardener returned to his favorite topic of conversation, bugs and how to kill them. Between you and me, dude, and you don't need to share this with all the damn greenies around here, I'm a big fan of pesticides. I don't see what all the fuss is about, said the future AMA cardholder. Pesticides have kept a lot of people from starving over the years. <clears throat> from pesticides Talk turned to what, if anything, these gardens were producing for the citizens of Salvacion to eat. Hippocrates, who apparently had never considered this brain teaser, tried to recall what he had actually seen growing in their gardens. I think I may have seen some lettuce in a couple of them, he recalled, grooming his beard with his fingers in concentration. No... Not lettuce. I know. Now I remember. Radishes. That's what it was. A bunch of radishes. Radishes, of course, I laughed. Every kindergartner, gardener's delight. But I'm not sure you can survive on a diet of radishes. What kind of seeds did you plant in the last garden you built? Seeds? Hippocrates repeated, looking at me blankly like he had never heard such a technical horticultural term before. You know, seeds, I repeated. They're those little white things you stick in the ground and cover with dirt. They're supposed to turn into plants. Wow, dude, you sound like you know a lot about organic gardening. We can sure use you on the team. You need to talk to the person in charge. And who would that be, I asked. That's part of the problem around here, he said. I've been here over two weeks, and I've never figured out who is in charge. I thought Joaquin was the man in charge around here, I said. Joaquin? You mean Joaquin Rivers? That guy is some kind of millionaire venture capitalist or something. I know more about gardening than that guy ever will. 
Minutes later, we were driven out of my tranquil place, not by a horde of chiggers, but much worse, by a boat full of local Peruvians and mobbed the gazebo and started pitching dome tents all over the place. What the hell? As politely as I could, I asked one of the intruders who they were and how long they planned to stay in the gazebo. Over the first joyous whoops of a building soccer game on the lawn outside, the guy explained to me that they were students invited by Green Empowerment for their three-day workshop. They would be colonizing the gazebo until Thursday. I could kiss that tranquil place goodbye too. With nothing else to do to fill our time, use our energy, or offer our talents to Manu Learning Center, Hippocrates and I decided to check out the status of lunch. On the way, we encountered a local child, the son of one of the green empowerment invitees, terrorizing and mutilating a fat earthworm he had found in the rain-saturated grass. Now there is a way you bio-garden volunteers could put yourself to use. I coached him. Every one of those raised beds could use about a thousand earthworms. You can stay busy all week. Count me out of that job, Hippocrates protested. You already know my opinion of bugs. As I mentioned way back when, the peripatetic Joaquin Rivers was ostensibly visiting his pet project to celebrate Manu Learning Center's four-year anniversary that very day. I say ostensibly because I am 99% sure the real reason, or at least a major reason he was in Peru, was to check up on the shenanigans of Hunt Oil, who hoped to run a seismic trail across his acreage. One explosion every 60 feet and build a heliport behind the bio garden. I had left my conversation with Joaquin back in Cusco with the confident assurance that we were two members on the same team with the same worthy goal to kick the bastards out of the Amazon. As the dining hall began to fill with party goers from Salvacion to celebrate Manu Wildlife Center's biggest day of the year, and to snag a free lunch and play a game of soccer, the jovial host took a moment out of his busy schmoozing to sidle up to me and quietly but firmly, firmly asked me to accompany him and his shadow, Miguel, to his inner sanctum, his exact term at Manu Learning Center. His private cabin tucked away into the very rear corner of the compound, I felt vaguely as if I were in the middle of a scene straight out of The Godfather following Don Juan Joaquin and his chief gunslinger into some dark antechamber of the vine-covered mansion while the band entertained the guest on the lawn. Don Joaquin insisted that I take the only comfortable chair in the room while he and Miguel sat cross-legged on the floor like a couple of bowling pin-shaped Buddhas. With a warm crocodile smile and a cool grin in his eye, the consummate negotiator assured me how much he appreciated my passion in my fight against the bastards at Hunt Oil. Then he quickly got down to the but that always follows the introductory clause, I really appreciate your passion. In this case, the but had something more or less to do with some legal advice he had received since our last meeting to distance himself from the overpassionate loose cannon from Texas. This was not the first time I had been chided for being too passionate in my environmental extremism, and I guarantee you it won't be the last, and I make no apology for it. Unlike me, Joaquin reminded me, the large landowner was intricately tied into the pro-hunt oil Salvacion community, as evidenced by the three dozen Salvacionites milling around outside 
and he had to play his anti-hunt cards a little closer to the chest than I did. You need to understand my position here, Sam, he said, with Miguel nodding vigorously in agreement. I have eight years of my life and a million and a half dollars of my money invested in this place, and I can't afford to have you come down here and fuck that up for me by saying something that might lead people to, to believe you are speaking for me. He wished me well in my struggle, but insisted that I cease and desist all discussion of hunt oil with the staff and volunteers, lest someone jump to the conclusion that I was speaking for him. I assured the man that I understood his delicate position, and I did, and that I would respect his wishes. Good, he said, smiling broadly. Now that that is out of the way, let's party! He and Miguel disappeared into the growing clump of party-goers, dropping me like the passionate hot potato I had become, still am, and always will be. I would not have another conversation with Joaquin for six more days and never did have a single private conversation with Miguel the whole time I was there. Not that I was treated rudely or as a pariah or anything like that. I was simply ignored, invisible, and completely irrelevant to anything going on at Manu Learning Center. So, before I say one more word, let me make this clear Hambone disclaimer. I, Hambone Littletail, environmental alarmist, doomsday prophet, and chronicler of the downfall of Western civilization, am not speaking for, have never spoken for, and never will speak for Kreas Foundation or Joaquin Rivers. Period. By anyone's measure, the birthday party was a roaring success the good citizens of Salvacion could wait another day to empower themselves with green visions of creating sustainable lifestyles for themselves in the rainforest. On this chilly, drizzly Sunday, it was burgers for everyone, except us eight party-pooping non-beef eaters, cooked with gas that most likely came from Hunt Oil's jungle-destroying Camasea Gold gas field. Following the burger feast, we were treated to two dance performances by what I assume were children from local Indian villages downriver. Salvacion is home to some 1,200 mixed-blood mestizos from the highlands, but the real natives live in the communities downstream. First up was a co-ed troupe of a dozen youngsters aged 6 to 8 shaking their booties to a CD of vaguely Amazonian-sounding music, powered by the gasoline-powered generator, the kids looked like a cross between Pocahontas and Hula Girls from Hawaii, even the boys. Whether or not the dance steps had anything to do with real, traditional tribal dances, and I can't imagine that they did, the dancers were indeed adorable, in a tragic sort of way. Next up were the teenagers, whose performance at least appeared to be more traditional to my untrained eye as they acted out what I think was supposed to be some kind of jaguar hunt, but I could be completely wrong. All that booty shaking had worked up quite an appetite for processed sugar among the dancers and audience members alike. Two candle-spangled birthday cakes, one of which looked like a cross between a football and a UFO, were carted out from the kitchen. After a rousing rendition of the Peruvian national anthem, I think, candles were lit, happy birthday to Manu Learning Center were belted out in two languages, and Joaquin extinguished the flames with one breath. I'm not sure whether this is a custom... I'm not sure whether this is a custom 
in all of Peru <clears throat> or whether it is a birthday ritual specific to Manu Learning Center, <clears throat> but the cheering crowd riled up by the head honcho's successful defeat of the candle flames insisted that Joaquin initiate the cake feeding frenzy by taking the first bite from the body of the cake without benefit of knife or fork. As the crowd cheered, he bent forward, he bent toward the cake like he was bobbing for apples. When he resurfaced, his face looked like a got milk billboard on a bad acid trip. While Manu Learning Center's head cook and bottle washer cleaned up his face and the rest of us were served our cake via more traditional means, Joaquin Shadow gave a rousing speech, speech in Spanish, which was, more than anything else, a long-winded introduction to his idol's short-winded speech. Ever the consummate host, the humble servant, I mean, this guy was good, kept his official words to a minimum, not mentioning Hunt Oil one time to the petroleum-friendly crowd as he gazed into the future and gave the staff and volunteers all the credit for keeping the Crea's vision alive. A short speech, yes, but a stirring one as well. The only thing missing on the scene was Robert Altman yelling, Cut! at the end of it. One of the gala affairs many guests was none other than the enigmatic Ramon, the Shintuya native boyfriend of Patrice, who Joaquin had recommended to me to be my guide into the Amaracare communal reserve. Ramon was not hard to spot. His handsome, serious face framed by a mane of straight shoulder-length black hair towered over all the other guests native and Peruvian alike. Only Miguel and a few of the volunteers were taller. Even dressed in the classic outfit of Goodwill shorts and t-shirt, Ramon was, you just knew, the genuine article. His natural grace, perfect posture, no slouching Indian hair, and Hollywood good looks inspired confidence in anyone meeting him for the first time, and I knew from the moment I met him that he was the perfect candidate to lead me on the Indiana Jones fantasy that I was hatching. The hike to the lost Inca ruins in the very heart of Americari, where Hunt Oil, with or without its certificate of the non-existence of archaeological sites soon planned to detonate more than 12,000 explosives. Ramon, Patrice, and I snuck off to the tent-covered gazebo to hatch our plan while everyone else cranked up a soccer game on the lawn. Ramon, who had spent every one of his 31 years in the native community of Shintuya on the western edge of Amarakari, had never set foot anywhere near the ruins, which lay some 30 miles through the southeast as the Hunt Oil helicopter flies, but quite possibly five times that distance on foot. However, he didn't seem concerned about this small detail. Patrice roughly translated for him, There's a big rock in the middle of the Colorado River behind a big whirlpool. The ruins will be on the left bank just past that rock. It's steep back there. They'll be like Machu Picchu, not very easy to reach. They'll be covered in jungle, not very easy to see. At that point, Spirit broke in and waved this tiny red flag over my left shoulder, but I was so confident in Ramon, I waved her away. I next asked Ramon if he knew any other gringos who had made the journey. Patrice roughly translated, This guy Klaus from Denmark took an expedition up there several years ago to look for the ruins, but he got bitten by a snake before they found them. He didn't die, but they had to carry him out, and that was the end of that expedition. 
Since then, I have heard rumors that Klaus did succeed later, but he has not returned repeated emails, so I can't confirm that. With this news, Spirit began waving a red flag with a fair delance on it, but again, I waved her away. I've been tromping around the woods for 50 years, and I haven't been bitten by a damn snake yet. Someday, I'm going to write a book called Famous Last Words by the late Hambo Littletail. Looking at the map, it was clear we weren't going to be able to, to just jog over a dozen rivers and three mountain ranges to get from Shintuya to the ruins. I figured perhaps a week of hard walking. I asked Ramon his best estimate, keeping in mind the 30-minute refrains of Peruvian bus drivers, and did not need Patrice to translate his answer, 30 dias, 30 days. At this news, Spirit started doing handstands on my left shoulder to get my attention. 30 days? What about food? Patrice translated, I have a shotgun and fish hooks. We won't starve. I thought of Marino, my Stone Age Indian friend from Yomabato, producing two sardines and three days of fishing. I could see spirit on my left shoulder stirring up a big pot of monkey brain stew and grilling up some nice plump grubs and maggots as appetizers. This is starting to sound expensive, I said, as Spirit cleaned out the ATM on my left shoulder. How much is this going to cost me? Ramon scrunched up his face and concentrated, counting off some figures on the calculator of his fingers. He figured three guys at ten bucks a day each ought to cover it, assuming, of course, that I was planning to carry my own bag of cannonballs up and down near vertical mountains and ford a dozen piranha and stingray infested rivers and didn't need a porter to help me do that. Not counting the upfront cost, including a digital camera, I was looking at, oh, a thousand bucks or so, minimum. <clears throat> One gnawing little gringo concern I did have was that the ruins were on the Rio, Colorado. Perhaps you recall from the name recall the name from chapter 17. The Rio Colorado is home to a growing number of pirate gold miners. A Peruvian pirate gold miner, 50 miles from the nearest cop, particularly one or a dozen, from a tribe with a long history of enmity with Ramon's tribe, didn't exactly strike me as the kind of person you would want to bump into on a dark trail through the jungle. Patrice roughly translated, he, sa he says he hopes that anyone he meet along the way is unarmed and in a good mood. With that announcement, Spirit stepped off my left shoulder and onto a tightrope stretching all the way across the Mother of God, doing her best flying Walenda impression to get my attention. That settles it, I thought, as I drifted off to sleep in my comfy bed behind my cucaracha net with my middle-aged gringo Indiana Jones fantasies floating through my head. On August 1st, I would be setting out on a month-long expedition through a pirate and snake-infested jungle with a shotgun-toting Indian who spoke no English to look for some long-lost Inca ruins that had never been seen by a white man before just past a big rock in the middle of a river. No problem. Harrison Ford, move over. I would challenge any publisher in the world to say no to this story. And that brings us to the end of chapter 22. And we're going to go a little bit off course here in chapter 23 with St. Peter's Witty. Coming right up.